So, as you have seen for the triple point, solid vapor, liquid vapor, uh, basically solid liquid vapor coexistence, right? We have derived that, we have derived, right, that T3, which is the triple point temperature, is related to the difference in the heats of transmission of alpha to gamma. Alpha to gamma is solid to gas and liquid to gas uh, transformation, right? Beta to gamma is liquid to gas and it has also this relation to this AS and AV, right? These are the coefficients, right? AS and AV. Now, this is T3. Again, some algebraic manipulation later, we have shown that P3, that is the triple point pressure, again is related to these coefficients AS and AV. And remember the coefficients. This is something that you have to remember. How did we look at the coefficients? We did this thing, right? P equal to P naught e to the power minus chi. So, P naught basically, for example, e to the power minus chi. So, here P naught is the coefficient, right? Here P naught is the coefficient. So, we can basically, the coefficients are related to the P vapor or P sol, uh, sublimation means the temperature at which sublimation occurs the, or the pressure at which sublimation occurs, the temperature at which sublimation occurs. So, these are basically the, the pressures are going to be the coefficient. So, if you look at that AV, if you see the relation, this is pressure, right? This is this is pressure. So, this is in Pascal. So, then the exponent has no unit, right? The exponent has no unit, right? It's joule by joule. So, it has no unit. So, obviously, A s. So, basically, A s comma A v. These are basically going to be units of pressure. So, these are units of pressure. And if you compare, these are nothing, nothing but A s and A v are nothing but some standard pressures of transmission from either from solid to gas, right? Here it is solid to gas transformation or say liquid to gas transformation and A s for example is basically a standard pressure of, so it can be like standard pressure of sublimation, uh, right? This or this can be standard, so in this case this is a beta to gamma. So, this is like standard pressure of vaporization and then there is some, so we can think of some standard or reference state and that ref, this is again at that reference state P naught S. So, basically P naught S or so basically A S and A V are related to, we can tell are related to P naught S uh, or P naught V, right? P naught S basically or P naught sublimation and this is P naught vaporization, right? So, these are related, A S and A V are related, right? A S is related to P naught sublimation and A V is related to P naught vaporization. Now, see, you have this, then think of this, you have this relation. Again, you see here this is A S and this is A V, both have the units of pressure. So, again, within L n there is no unit. So, you have here joules per mole Kelvin and you have here also you have so R is joules per mole this is joules per mole and this is joules per mole Kelvin so you can see this gives you Kelvin right it gives you Kelvin so temperature the unit is in Kelvin and you see these are related to the difference in heats of transmission of alpha to gamma alpha to gamma remember this is like solid this is solid to vapor this is liquid to vapor solid to vapor and this is liquid to vapor now as you know solid to vapor is like solid to liquid liquid to vapor you can think of that okay now if you do a little bit of algebra okay again taking ln on both sides basically you are taking ln on both sides okay you have taken this expression of t3 you put that here okay if you, you have taken this expression of t3 you put t3 expression here right uh, right so or say in the in the previous expression here okay so here you are taking the expression for t3 right at r t3 so if you do that and then you take ln on both sides logarithm on both sides and you can basically come up with so delta hd for example here i have told is basically the difference between this right alpha to gamma transformation enthalpy minus beta to gamma transformation enthalpy right so now you can basically uh, with a little bit of rearrangement and uh, algebraic manipulation you can come up with this expression okay by the way in the exam if i give a question let 
this, I will basically give these expressions. Okay, you don't have to remember anything, but you have to understand. Okay, what you have to understand is that P3 is related to this again, the pressure, there is a pressure and there is an exponent and this exponent is again, uh, you see AS is related to beta 2 gamma by beta 2 gamma minus alpha 2 gamma. So, right? This is basically the exponent is the ratio of enthalpy of beta 2 gamma by the beta 2 gamma minus alpha 2 gamma that enthalpy difference. This is the tr transformation, the enthalpy of trans difference in the enthalpy of transformation and this is the enthalpy of transformation from liquid to vapor. In this case, this is from solid to vapor and again this is the difference between the enthalpies of transformation of solid to vapor. Uh, uh, difference between solid to vapor and liquid to vapor, right? And again, AV is one pressure term. Now, if you have this, you please try to understand that this is an exponent here, right? This is a power here. So, as you know that this logarithm and exponents becomes, uh, gives you a very nice way to deal with the triple point calculation. So basically what it tells you is that if you do ln p3 then this guy comes down or this guy comes down, right? So if you do ln p3 you can write it as a very simple expression in terms of uh, some this coefficient times ln as plus this coefficient times ln p. So basically logarithm, so p if I can use a logarithmic scale calculations become easier. Further, you can make some approximation that the triple point in general at one atmosphere pressure or um, uh, at not one atmosphere pressure, at, tip, at pressures below one atmosphere, the triple points are very close to the melting point. So how do you do that is coming this example, right? I was start, I started with this example, so I will go further down. So we have, this is basically phase diagram of silicon. It's a very important material now. It's a semiconductor, so it's a phase diagram of silicon. You have to process silicon, you have to make silicon as pure as possible. Now again, look at silicon and if you look at silicon, silicon can sublimate, say basically the sublimation, the enthalpy, the enthalpy of sublimation from alpha to gamma for silicon, again can be written as sum of enthalpy of uh, melting of silicon plus, right, alpha to beta is melting, right, liquid to solid. and enthalpy of beta to gamma, right? Delta H alpha to gamma. So, alpha to gamma process is divided, subdivided into two processes, alpha to beta and beta to gamma. Now, see another thing as I told in the previous lecture that boiling point has to be greater than the melting point, right? The boiling point usually is greater than the melting point at one atmosphere pressure, big C 10 to the power 0. <laughs> so, the, 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 ex, excuse me. So, <clears throat> so, you, as you can see, this is pressure in the log scale, okay, we have plotted pressure in the log scale and the pressure unit is in atmosphere. So, this is 10 to the power 0. So, 10 to the power 0 means 1 atmosphere. So, this is basically 1 atmosphere pressure and these pressures are much below, right? You can see here it is 10 to the power minus 25, right? It's 10 to the power minus 25 which is like a very, very low pressure and then uh, this is like 10 to the power minus 5. How did I get into this point? So, basically, if you now look at it, you have pressure plotted in the log scale and you have temperature on the above axis I am plotting temperature and it means at one atmosphere so you can see I have plotted here two points I know the melting point and say I know the boiling point at one atmosphere for pure silicon right this is pure silicon right I know the I know the at pure silicon this is room temperature so this is one atmosphere and this point corresponds to room temperature these points corresponds to melting point and this is the boiling point. So, I have plotted these three points only, okay. Now, you see at one atmosphere and 300 Kelvin, this part is definitely going to be, this part is definitely going to be solid, right. And then beyond melting point, this is liquid, right. And then beyond, so this part is liquid, right, this is solid this is liquid and this part is basically the vapor, the silicon vapor, right? So, because it is above boiling point. Now, this is all at one atmosphere, right? We know at one atmosphere. Now, you see, I have the three points. I also need to know the enthalpy. Say, for example, this is the delta H of pure silicon from liquid to vapor and we know, say, that it has 386 kilojoules per mole. 
right 386 kilojoules per mole at measured at one atmosphere and at the boiling point which is 2873 kelvin right so we need to know the boiling point right at one atmosphere so we know that now if i know that if i know that then basically i can calculate a v right which is basically equal to p v times e to the power now this becomes so p v was a v times e to the power minus delta h s i by r t so a v will be p v times e to the power plus delta h s i by r t right this minus sign is not there so minus sign has become plus right because i have taken p v on this side so i have taken the exponent on the p v side on the pressure side uh, p v side and this is the p v not and so basically p v if i put in as one atmosphere then i get 1.04 then power 7 atmosphere as a v right so basically i get a v a uh, coefficient as 1.04 into 10 to the power 7 atmosphere if i plug in this value of 386 kilojoules per mole for liquid to vapor and i plug in r and i plug in t equals to 2873 then i get this right now i also know tm right i also know tm now i make an assumption i tell that in such a setting the T3 is not very much different than TM because TM, T, T, T3 T has to lie between melting and boiling point, right? So, T, if T3 has to lie between melting and boiling point, we are assuming that, let us assume that TM at one atmosphere, that 1685, that T3 at whatever be the pressure, I don't know the pressure yet, I don't know the pressure yet, but I am assuming T3 to be 1685. Now, I also know... <coughs> The enthalpy of transformation of silicon from solid to liquid, which is 50.2. Again, it is plus because solid has to absorb it and then it will transform to liquid. Now, if you have all this information, what information do you have? You have this information, you have this information, and you also know the coefficient AV, right? But you are also assuming T3. Now, if you are assuming T3, you can calculate P3. How? You have PV, which is basically... 1.04 in 10 to the power 7, right? PV is equal to 1.04 in 10 to the power 7 into e to the power minus 386000 by 8.314 T. Now, P at P3, T has to be equal to T3, right? T has to be equal to T3. So, as you can see here, first of all, I calculated AV. How did I calculate AV? I substituted PV equals to 1 atmosphere and then I looked right because we are looking at one atmosphere boiling point and then i plugged in the boiling point here and i got av now i take the same expression here so pv equals to av exponential minus delta hsi so pv equal to av times now if i take it this way exponential minus delta hsi l2v by rt but we are telling t3 is the same as tm okay this is an approximation t3 is the same as tm and basically i plug in t3 here right if i plug in t3 here so i get p3 so p3 is 1.13 in the minus 5 atmosphere so basically at this point i mark this point so i join them i join them right i join them and then i have also tv so i join this and I go farther down. Now, what is this pressure? Can anyone tell me? So, this is the pressure. This is, say, see, this pressure corresponds to something like slightly above 10 to the minus 25, but that's 300 Kelvin. So, what does it tell you? So, you think about it, but I'll tell you. Now, if you see, so I got P3. So, basically, I know, if I know T3, that it does not shift too much then t3 does not shift too much from melting point if i tell right why can i tell that because t3 has to lie between tm and tb and in all pra for all practical purposes as i go towards the uh, as i go towards low pressure so it will shift more towards tm right the t3 the triple point has to shift more towards tm so basically this point o signifies your so this point o signifies your T3. So, T3 and Tm are same and we got P3 from this expression, right, from this expression. And we have calculated AV assuming P equal to 1 atmosphere and Tb equals to 2873 Kelvin. But as you know that uh, P, this equation holds true for P3 means for the temperature when 
t equal to t3 or the triple point temperature. So we know the pressure. Now you see, as I told you, that the enthalpy of transformation of pure silicon from solid to vapor is the sum of enthalpy of silicon um, uh, from solid to liquid and enthalpy of sil pure silicon from liquid to vapor. That's the sum, right? A solid to vapor is solid to liquid, is liquid to vapor. So you can see here 50.2 plus 386, which is 436.2. Now kilojoules per mole and basically now AS so basically you can get now AS value you have 1685 and what will be this is P3 so basically from there you can get the heat of sub, uh, the, the pressure uh, the pressure uh, of sublimation the pressure of sublimation at different temperatures now tell me at temperature T equal to at temperature T equal to say uh, if I take temperature T equals to say um, uh, 300 Kelvin then find out what will be PS okay so that is one task that you have you find out the pressure okay now so remember PS is the pressure of vaporization so here when we are looking at here what is the phase we are looking at is it the solid phase now solid phase here is going to gaseous phase are you seeing that so basically the solid phase at this point if you see this is a critical point which basically uh, or uh, this is like a phase boundary point between solid phase and vapor phase now at 300 kelvin this is the pressure that will basically this is the pressure of transformation or at or at this <laughs> at 300 kelvin and at this pressure solid and gas will coexist right solid silicon will coexist with gaseous silicon right or vapor, vapor silicon right so find out this pressure you see whether you get a pressure which is corresponding to this this value so you have t equal to 300 and you find out the pressure okay so this is how you can check that you are more or less more or less um, uh, uh, correct with the assumption that tm in the log because see the variation in pressure is very very minuscule right that's why i am using so the variation means basically like one atmosphere this is 10 to the minus 5 atmosphere where you are getting this thing right and you see the 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 the, the for solid to vapor the the, the 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 pressure has to be very very small right pressure has to be very very small um for solid to vapor coexistence in silicon right so and the pressure has to be reasonably high for solid solid to liquid uh, coexistence to happen right and this is where solid liquid and gas right solid liquid and gas can coexist okay so that is the idea that i am trying to tell you okay <sighs> so so this is coming from uh, by the way this is a book from uh, this is a uh, book example this is an example from robert professor de hop's book okay so this is robert de hop book if you look at robert de hop books uh, de hop's book on thermodynamics in material science you will basically get this example okay in chapter 7 you will get this example it's a very nice example and a demonstration that tm and t3 does not really uh, change too much okay and as you can see what we have done we have taken a baseline of one atmosphere and we are looking at pressures that are lower and as we know that the the, the triple point always will shift to uh, the triple point where solid liquid and gas will coexist will always shift to lower pressures right it will always shift to lower pressures you can think of any other example you can repeat this uh, the, 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 the same idea and you will basically see that the triple point always shift uh, shifts the triple point is where the solid liquid gas coexistence in most of the pure element where pure substances um, basically shifts towards uh, lower pressures right uh, uh, near the melting point right so now there is one very important example that very important example that I'll give. Okay, again, it comes from a problem that is given in an exercise in Professor Dehoff's book. Okay, so this problem is basically, so as I told you, so this is again, the way I have drawn this, these are all, assume that these are, these are all, uh, basically, this is not like, um, I am taking it from a CalFAD database or something. This is an approximate uh, analysis, but 
Although it's an approximate analysis, it gives you a very good approximation of the actual values. Okay, I am not taking the CalFed. I am not taking the uh, the the database that is basically coming from the experimental experimental data and fitting it to the, some curves. I'll uh, I'll come to how this CalFed procedure is done. I'll give a brief about how this is done. But please try to understand these are basically approximate free energy curves. So these are basically the molar free energy curves as a function of temperature for three phases. Okay, in so in pure titanium. So this is the epsilon phase or the FCP phase. As you can see, as you go towards, as you are in the lower temperature regime, so basically less than T A or T epsilon beta. Okay, A is nothing but T epsilon beta. As you are less than T epsilon beta, you see epsilon to be the lowest energy phase, right? Epsilon. So basically, below A, epsilon is the lowest energy phase, right? This is mu versus T. Remember, this is not the phase diagram, right? This is basically giving you three free energies. One is for liquid. One corresponds to beta. One corresponds to epsilon, right? This is the epsilon free energy as a function of temperature. Let us assume the pressure is kept constant at one atmosphere or one bar. Okay. Pressure is kept constant one bar. We are looking at the variation in free energy as a function of temperature. And uh, this is pure pure titanium. And as you can see, below Ta, below Ta, epsilon, right? Epsilon has the lowest energy below Ta. Then between A and B, that is below Tb, which is the epsilon. To, so B is basically uh, a very special point. So I'll come to that. But as you can see, between A and C, between A and C, look at the green curve here. Look at this. This is the, the green curve corresponds to the energy of the BCC phase beta. Okay. BCC allotrope of titanium or BCC structure of titanium. Okay. Or this BCC phase of pure titanium, which is beta. Right. Now, as you can see here, in this regime between A and C, this has the lowest energy, right? This has the lowest energy from the diagram. So basically here, so here if epsilon is stable, here beta is stable and here as you can see this blue corresponds to the liquid phase, the blue curve corresponds to liquid phase which has higher energy up to C but beyond C titanium has, so titanium has become liquid, right? It has become liquid. So now I will talk about metastability. Metastability is where, when does it happen? Metastability is have means basically a phase that has higher energy somehow appears because the low the, the lowest energy phase somehow does not form. For example, diamond has formed instead of graphite, although graphite is the lowest energy phase of carbon. Uh, somehow due to certain conditions you see that graphite is absent and you have formed diamond and diamond to graphite transformation does not take place at all. So it remains as it is unless you give a very large um, uh, energy or there is a very large energy input, diamond will remain as diamond. It does not convert to convert to graphite. Okay, so uh, you will uh, you'll soon see that in steels, for example, there is something called some phase called cementite, okay, which is an integral part of, um, of, of, of perlite. Right, of perlitic steels in cementite, the cement, the lowest form of the, the lowest form, the lowest energy phase, okay, at uh, at at room temperature is basically is not cementite, but it's graphite. But once cementite is formed, it does not transform to graphite or diamond. Okay, so that is the point. So see, think of this. You have now, if you if you look at this, if you do not think of metastability, you do not think of metastability. Everywhere you have epsilon. Epsilon is the lowest energy phase below Ta, beta is the lowest energy phase between Ta and Tc and beyond Tc, beyond Tc or T beta liquid, this is the liquid is the lowest energy phase, right? The blue phase is the lowest, the blue free energy curve is lowest. Then the green free energy curve is the lowest in the A to C regime and here this orange one is the, so orange one is here. The, so if you look at that, orange one is here and the green one is here and this is where it is uh, the liquid, right? The blue one, right? So basically you can see that this coexistence happens. This coexistence happens if you have no metastability, 
Now think of this. So I'll just try to select this. and I'll paste it now as you can see here I will erase this curve now if I erase this curve there is no beta there is no beta and you have now only one one only one uh, temperature here because now beta phase does not exist beta phase which was a stable phase at at the intermediate temperature between a and c does not exist if that does not exist then this these lines are also not there now you have epsilon l coexistence you have epsilon l coexistence right so epsilon is the low temperature phase okay and liquid is the high temperature phase so epsilon converts to liquid so we are telling now find t epsilon l so what we told i know 2 t epsilon beta which is the equilibrium transformation so i know t epsilon beta right which is basically a point i know t beta l which is again an equilibrium point i want to find t epsilon l which is basically see the t epsilon l should not have appeared if there would have been beta then t epsilon l does not exist because this is that much higher the energy is much higher than the green phase right the green green curve the green curve corresponds to beta phase so beta phase will obviously appear below this right so basically beta phase is more uh, more favorable here however because of some reason beta phase is not form so then what is this temperature and that's what i am telling here okay so this is basically where the beta phase which is the most stable phase at the temperatures between a and c right at the at temperatures between a and c beta phase is the most stable phase but it is somehow absent it did not form so now you have a metastability between epsilon and l right a metastable equilibrium between epsilon and l right now you want to find out this okay now see think of this we know now you want to find out this right melting point of epsilon ti you want to find out melting point of epsilon ti again when you do any such problem any such problem I, as you have seen before when i have whenever i have given examples whenever i have given examples what i have done i have gone to the final expression then i have put values then i have put values i don't put values from the beginning okay because then sometimes you may make mistake in getting the correct expression so first of all if you think of melting point of epsilon ti you have to think of this equilibrium right the free energy of epsilon this is the metastable equilibrium that the free energy of epsilon equal to free energy of liquid that's a metastable equilibrium now think of this if mu epsilon equal to mu liquid i can take mu beta out on both sides so now you have mu epsilon minus mu beta equal to mu l minus mu beta now if you think of this the the, the way we have written that means this is delta mu beta to epsilon and this is delta mu beta this is delta mu beta to epsilon which is basically minus of delta mu epsilon to beta right which is minus of delta mu epsilon to beta okay and this is happening at what temperature so this is happening at t epsilon l so that means this equation is also valid at t epsilon l right and we want to know what is t epsilon l so now think of this you also know for example the delta sm that's the entropy change so obviously the entropy so the more this the more stable phase that higher temperatures the more stable phase will have more entropy so if you think of that then delta sm epsilon to beta which is sm beta minus sm epsilon which is equal to plus 3.6 right sm beta minus epsilon epsilon at 1155 kelvin so ta equals to so basically t epsilon to beta is equal to or t epsilon beta in short is equal to 1155k and for epsilon to beta transformation at t epsilon beta temperature the the the, the 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 entropy change is plus 3.6 joules per mole kelvin remember it's plus uh, uh, 3.6 moles per uh, joules per mole kelvin and as you know that at t epsilon l okay as you know from this curve 
that at t epsilon l the free energy that at t epsilon l nu epsilon is greater than mu beta right the free energy of epsilon is greater than free energy of beta at t epsilon l so now think of this you are doing an integration okay you are doing an integration okay and also remember we are doing it at constant pressure and you know mu equals to minus s small s okay this is entropy per mole dt plus v dp and it's constant pressure so it is minus s dt because dp goes to zero so you have minus sm dt okay so similarly you can write d mu beta to epsilon is minus delta sm beta to epsilon remember it is minus delta sm why it is minus s dt and you see you are going from beta to epsilon right minus delta sm beta to epsilon okay and what is the temperature you started with tl right you were here you were in the t epsilon liquid right that was your temperature right this is the equation we have written at t epsilon equal, uh, liquid right this is t epsilon liquid or tb so this equation is valid at tb right so so if you see we are starting with t epsilon l and we are going to 2 epsilon b t epsilon beta now you please know that this is beta to epsilon so basically you are looking at beta to epsilon transformation now beta to epsilon transformation so this is basically epsilon to, to beta transformation is plus so beta to epsilon will be negative right okay so basically so delta minus delta sm beta to epsilon is nothing but delta sm epsilon to beta and this is nothing but t epsilon beta right this is t epsilon t epsilon beta minus t epsilon liquid so this is your first equation so this is your first equation mu epsilon minus mu beta is basically delta s m epsilon to beta t epsilon beta minus t epsilon liquid now remember t epsilon beta is lower right according to our uh, our curve t epsilon beta is at a lower temperature than this is higher temperature right and this is delta s m epsilon to beta okay now you see mu epsilon is greater than mu beta is what we have uh, we we know right at uh, but now this mu epsilon is greater than mu beta at t epsilon liquid now but at t epsilon beta just below t epsilon beta for example mu epsilon is less than mu beta right so these are the things that you have to understand and from and if you see i just use this equation mu equals to minus s t t to get this equation right and i have taken t epsilon l as a reference right this is the temperature that i want to find out right but t epsilon beta the equilibrium temperature is known and we know delta sm beta to epsilon okay beta to epsilon at uh, so i know say for example delta sm beta to epsilon now i have made an approximation here i am telling that i know the delta sm beta to epsilon or epsilon to beta at the transmission temperature t epsilon beta but i do not know at t epsilon liquid but i am assuming it to be the same that's why i have taken it out of the integration otherwise i should have known this variation and i should have so this is an approximation that we are using right that is an this is an approximation because delta sm can be a function of temperature and it will change from one equilibrium temperature to another so this is the metastable equilibrium temperature that is the epsilon this is the epsilon beta equilibrium temperature at this temperature only i know this but we are assuming that we this is the same here also okay so now we are telling this equation so that's that's how we arrive at this equation similarly for beta to liquid you have minus delta sm beta to liquid now beta to liquid is all our equilibrium only thing that you have to remember that you have t epsilon l as the reference temperature that is the starting temperature so minus delta sm beta to liquid again minus delta sm beta to liquid t beta liquid minus t epsilon liquid here remember t beta liquid is greater than t epsilon liquid this is less than t epsilon liquid right now you see mu l minus mu beta is this right now this is your equation number two okay so equation number two now if you see this is this i have labeled as equi so equi tells you this equal to this mu epsilon minus mu beta equal to mu l minus mu beta at t epsilon right liquid so we are telling that from equi one and two are equal right one and two are equal because all of these we are looking at the changes but we are looking at the changes from the same stand the same reference state which is the t epsilon liquid which we do not know now if i do that if i equate that then i basically get this relation delta sm epsilon to beta t epsilon beta minus t epsilon liquid equal to minus delta sm beta to liquid t epsilon beta liquid minus t epsilon liquid 
Now, if I arrange a little bit, I get this. See, delta SM epsilon to beta. So basically, this one, this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, I am taking to the same side. So this times this, and this times this, and see, there is a minus sign. So if I take it here, then it becomes plus, plus, and this is this. So basically, now you want to find out T epsilon liquid, and it, as you can see. Some liquid terms I am taking to the so this term I am taking to this side. So if I do that, the minus sign minus sign so it's plus sign, and this also has a minus sign so this becomes plus. So this becomes just a summation of this times T of some liquid delta S M sum to beta beta to liquid. See if you see there is a very interesting connotation here. See epsilon to beta, beta to liquid. The sum is there. So this is basically delta S M sum to liquid at T of some liquid. Right, so basically, I want to find out, but I still do not know till T S N liquid again. These we know at the transformation temperatures. Remember, we know this as T beta L. This we know at T epsilon beta. Right, these these, but we are assuming that the values do not change. The values do not change at T epsilon liquid. Okay, if we use this approximation, since I know these values, now see, I am plugging in the values. If I plug in the values, then basically I get, and this is delta epsilon, epsilon to beta, this is 3 plus 3.6, beta to liquid plus 8.6. So what we get is T epsilon liquid equal to 17, 10 Kelvin, right? We get 17, 10 Kelvin. Think of this now. It's very, very interesting. This is 1155 Kelvin, which is epsilon beta coexistence. And what is the beta liquid coexistence temperature? Beta liquid coexistence temperature is 1943 Kelvin. So if you see this, if you see the curve, this is 1155 Kelvin. Uh, how much is that? Uh, not 1155. Yeah, 1155 Kelvin. And this is 1943. And this we found out to be 17. Basically, if you do with any Kalfa later, I will show you that even with Kalfa databases, you will get very close to this temperature when you are looking at this metastable epsilon to liquid transmission. Okay, remember, metastable epsilon to liquid transmission only can happen if beta phase somehow does not form in the system. Beta phase is not formed, although beta phase has lower energy, right? So metastability is always greater than means in uh, in in terms of energy, metastability is having a beta stable equilibrium has a higher energy corresponding to the stable equilibrium stable equilibrium is lowest energy state so if i say the stable equilibrium does not happen then what you now look at is is there any metastable equilibrium in the system okay so this is how we do the analysis so this is one example i gave you i think that this makes sense to you and if it does not you please let me know where you are not understanding in your in the comment section then I will definitely try to answer as quickly as possible. Huh. So this this you don't have to care about. So I have already done this. So you don't require to look at this. Means this is one more approach by which you can get it. But I don't think that is required. Again and again, what I am trying to say. Only thing that see, I have come up with an expression. I have come up with an expression um, uh, where I haven't used any values. At the end, only from in this expression, in this expression that I have derived, I plug in the values and I get the metastable transformation temperature. Okay, so this is something that you should follow. Now, I come to a very interesting topic called thousands of solutions or mixtures. You can call it thousands of mixtures. Okay. Mixture means you are now looking at a multi component system. However, I will in this case, in this particular case, I will. Think of a multi component. So there can be solution, say for example, salt dissolving in water. So you have two components, salt and water, and it forms a solution or a mixture, right? Or sugar water mixture, or say for example, copper nickel mixture, like copper nickel alloy, it's a mixture of copper and nickel. 
okay, which forms a solution, okay, a solid solution. You can have a liquid solution where two liquids are mixing, for example, water and alcohol, or water and um, uh, uh, water and uh, uh, oil, okay, at some high temperatures they mix. So, or diff so two liquids mixing is one case. A solid dissolving in a uh, liquid is another case, or uh, no, two solids mixing is also another case. Okay, these are all like one is a solid solution, one is a liquid solution, one is um, some sort of a. See, ultimately, sodium chloride is mixing with so sodium a solid mixing in a so in a, in a in a dissolving in a liquid, right? Forming a solution. So we are looking at all of this. However, we are looking at non-reacting. Okay, so we are not. Uh, currently, we will not consider reaction, but soon I will consider it. But this is a non-reacting system. Currently, we are considering multi-component non-reacting system. The first thing that comes in is I will define now formally that see I have already defined something called a partial molar quantity, but I will tell you what does it. So, for example, I have introduced chemical potential right for a multi-component system. I have already done it. So, these quantities like chemical potential are called partial molar quantities or partial molar some books like the Hobbes book calls it molal okay so partial molar or partial molal quantities okay so partial molar some the, in the Hobbes book it's called instead of molar uh, the Hobbes writes it as molal quantity partial molal Okay, now, so think of this, you have a liter of pure water and is mixed with one mole of water, one mole of water at 25 degrees Celsius, one bar pressure. Now, raw water is one gram per centimeter cube that we know and one mole of water contains 18 grams of water. So, 18 grams and divided by density gives me 18 centimeter cubed, which is like 18 to the power minus 3 liter or 18 milliliters. 18 milliliters is the same as 18 cc. So basically the delta, so new volume is, the, the new total volume is 1018 ml because it was 1000 ml, 1000 ml to begin with. Now you have mixed water with water. So it has gone to 1018 and you get delta V which is 18 ml. Now see the, now you will see an interesting problem. Now if you have, so you have this molar volume of water which is 18 centimeter cube per mole. Right, we have mixed one one mole of water, and you are basically one. You mix one mole of water, you raise the volume by eighteen uh, milliliters, so that or eighteen centimeter cube. So that means the molar volume of water has to be eighteen centimeter cube per mole. Right now, think of this: you have one mole of water, but you have one liter of pure ethanol. Right, and there is an increase in volume, but this delta V mix now is fourteen centimeter cube or 14 ml. Why? See, it has to be, see, you have the same one mole of water. So, 18, it should have raised by 18 milliliter uh, or 18 centimeter cube, but it has raised only by 14 ml. This is because of the association of water molecules with the ethanol molecules. What will you see if you look at the microstructure, if you look at the, if you look under, under a microscope, you will see, uh, means a powerful microscope, you will see that each water molecule is surrounded by ethanol molecules. Again, each uh, ethanol molecule is surrounded by water molecules. So there is some some pack means the, the, the packing happens in this uh, say fashion like you have a uh, water molecule you have say a water molecule and then there is this ethanol molecules and then again you have one water molecule uh, each water molecule is surrounded by several ethanol molecules and each ethanol molecule is separate. So basically, ethanol, if you go to a water molecule, you will see it surrounded by ethanol and if you go to a ethanol molecule, you will see it surrounded by water. So in some way, this association has taken place and that results in a delta V mix, which is less. The association that has happened, the association that has happened has reduced the the increase in volume which it is no longer 18 milliliter it is now 14 milliliter okay because of this association something has happened some packing some interaction something has happened in such a way that the delta v mix has come out to be 14 milliliter per mole so now now think of this 
Now think of partial molar volume. What is the definition of components of a mixture vary with composition? As the environment of each type of component changes with the changing composition from pure A to pure B. So pure A, for example, is a pure ethanol and pure B is like pure water. Now as you change from pure A to pure B, pure ethanol to pure water, that means I am adding some little bit of water to pure ethanol. Every time my association is changing, association between A and B is changing, right? Because A is surrounded by B, surrounded by A, like that. So as a result, the volume, the 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 the, the, the amount of volume that will the, 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 the volume that the overall volume change the solution can basically be less than that where with pure water or with pure ethanol. Like we have pure ethanol, you add some little bit of one mole of ethanol, you will get a molar volume of ethanol. Now, if you add water uh, to one uh, liter of water, you will get some, the one mole of water, you get molar volume of water, right? You get molar, molar volume of water when you, uh, the exact molar volume of water, when you add one mole of water to one liter of water and find the change in volume. That change in volume is the molar volume of water. Similarly, for pure ethanol, if you add one mole of ethanol and you find the change in volume of the mixture, then you can tell that is the molar volume of ethanol. However, when it changes from A to B, that is from pure ethanol to pure water, right, you are adding more and more water so that, you know, you go to such an extreme dilution that ultimately it's all pure water. There is no ethanol left. But you think of this as you change from pure A to pure B, what is happening is because of the association between A and B and because of the interactions between A and B, what you will see is the app, app, the volume the, the, the volume change, the delta V is not that of, which does not correspond to the molar volume of ethanol or molar volume of water. It is something different because of the way association has happened. Okay, we will look at how this association happens. What are the different interactions that can happen? Like AA interactions can happen, BB interactions can happen, AB interactions can happen. Which interactions are stronger? Which interactions are more favorable? All these things basically lead to this change. Okay, and that change, that change, that the amount of the, 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 the contribution of water to the volume change of the mixture of ethanol and water is what is called as partial molar volume. So if you think of this, see this is the partial molar volume of water. So this is, this is, this is again from Atkins book. I have erupted this drawing. So if you look at that, this is partial molar volume of water. This is partial molar volume of ethanol, pure ethanol in centimeter cube per mole. As you can see, this is basically if you think this, this is basically changing. Now this is 0 to 1.0. So here you are looking at like say for example, um, you think about it. Okay, so you think about it, which is, so if you are looking at this, you are having a 14. So if you drop here, so you, as you can see the partial molar volume of ethanol. So partial molar volume of ethanol here is low. On this side is low. On this side, it is very, very high, right? On this side, it has increased. So is it? So, and again, for water, it is here quite high, which is 18. Are you seeing that? 18 centimeter cube per mole. So that means this is the pure water. Right, so it was 18, like pure water, which is basically zero ethanol, and this is pure ethanol, which has 58. So this 58 number and 18 number are basically the molar volume of water itself, VH2O, VM, basically you can call it like VM H2O, when you have pure water, and this is VM ethanol. But as you can see, it is changing, right? It is changing from it has it uh, when you go, go towards pure water, it has not abruptly gone to, you know, zero or anything, right? But, but um, it has some value here. Actually, this is an approximation here. Um, in general, if you look at it, you will say that it has gone to a very, very low. So basically, if you see it's a pure alcohol, it's like pure alcohol, then um, it's not. 
so 0 to 1 is not is 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 some sort of an exaggeration but you can see that at pure ethanol end at pure ethanol end the 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 molar volume of, of water has changed to 14 it has changed to 14 see so this pretty near pure, pure ethanol has changed to 14 so you remember please note that the partial molar volume does not exist basically it is like an if you see that it is going towards one and it is going towards zero so it's not like it is like 99.99 percent it means it's like a it's it's not full one pure uh, ethanol if you think that way uh, also is fine but it is like pure it is now pure ethanol as a molar volume as you can see as 58 so now i am telling in that approximation means that means the concentration of the solvent tends to pure ethanol at that concentration where you add some water one mole of water which is very little amount of water in a very large volume of ethanol then the volume the molar volume contribution is coming out to be 40 right and then it rapidly increases as it increases as you can see this is the molar volume of ethanol right molar volume of ethanol increases 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 and as it the partial molar volume it goes to it goes to so this is for the ethanol this is corresponding this is the v bar that i am plotting in this curve this is the v bar that i am plotting in this curve okay of ethanol right so this is the molar volume of ethanol how does it change how does it change it changes it drops you see molar volume of ethanol drops as you increase the amount of water molar volume of ethanol drops as you increase the amount of water and it goes to somewhere like between 14 and 16 something like 15 but if you look at molar volume of water as you increase the ethanol content it goes from pure water and then it decreases it decreases and it decreases up to 14 it goes to like 14 as you have like nearly 100 percent ethanol right obviously it is not fully 100 percent ethanol then water is not there but water is there it's a very high volume of ethanol and water is very very small it's like a dilute solution okay so i will talk about dilute solution i will talk about raoul's law and all so but you have to understand the concept the concept is this partial molar volume is the molar volume concentration or molar volume uh, the change the con contribution of water to the change in the overall volume of the mixture of ethanol and water so you have a mixture of ethanol so please try to understand the concept here you have a mixture of ethanol or, and water plus water solution you can call it water solution now in this solution what is the contribution of water okay if water is the solute and and say ethanol is a solvent that means ethanol is in much larger proportion now what is the partial contribution of water to the overall volume of the mixture overall volume of the mixture this is what is basically defined as the partial molar quantity or partial molar volume so that means if you have a mixture where you have n1 moles of component one say n1 moles of ethanol n2 moles of water and you have some nc moles of some ink and so on so you have all of these and you are mixing it now if you want to find say the molar vol the partial molar volume of component i okay partial molar volume note the very important term here distinction here you are looking at partial molar volume of component i you want to see the overall volume of this mixture how the overall volume changes as a function of change in the mole number of i keeping temperature pressure and mole number of all other components fixed if you see the partial molar volume is this vi bar then is termed as the partial molar volume of component i or contribution of component i to the total volume in the mixture okay so the partial molar volume is the contribution of one of the components to the total volume of the mixture okay so if you have a mixture of two components for example you can write and say you are taking fixed temperature and pressure then you can write an exact because volume is an exact differential right volume is an exact differential it's a function of temperature pressure mole number of a and b so it's a binary mixture of a and b so mole number of a is n a and mole number of b is n b then dv equals to del v del n a where p and t are fixed again p and t i have kept as fixed okay so that's why i did not uh, care about writing that uh, term with dp and term with dt because dt and dp are equal to zero right at fixed pressure and temperature 
Now you have del V del N A, P T N B into T N A, right? Plus del V del N B and differential of N B. And you have here P, T and N A constant. Note that here N A is constant. N A does not change. Here N B does not change. Here I am looking at the change in volume, overall volume, due to change in mole number of A. Due to change in mole number of A. Keeping pressure, temperature and N B constant. In the other way, it is like change in volume due to change in mole number of B. Keeping pressure, temperature and N A constant. Now this you can express as V bar D N A plus V bar B. TNP. Now think of Euler equation. Euler equation tells you V is nothing but V bar NA because you have done this Euler equation. So it's analogous to Euler equation. See ultimately if you integrate this for example, the amount of NA and NB are fixed say. If the amount of NA and NP are fixed, so you are going from say if you want to integrate and if you want to integrate and you want to integrate, it goes from 0 to NA and this goes from 0 to NB. But overall NA and NB are fixed. So at Amount of Na, if I add more Na, I have to take out more N, uh, some Mb, right? So basically, if that is so, then basically you can write that V equals to nothing but V bar A N A plus V bar B N B. Okay, this is exactly analogous to Euler equation, which we write, wrote as U equals to PV minus TS plus mu I N I. So if you do that, then DV equals to V bar A D N A plus V bar B D N B plus N A D A D V A bar. See, there is a N A and the differential of the molar volume of A and there is a differential of the molar volume of B. Now compare 3 and 1. Compare this equation, compare this equation to 1. Now if you do that, you see V A bar and V B, see N A D V A bar Right, change in the, the differential of the molar volume of component A and differential of the molar volume of component B. So differential of molar volume of component A is weighted with the mole number of A and this is weighted with the mole number of B. What you are getting Na dVA bar plus Nb dVA bar equal to C. Right, so that's the idea. So in general, if Z is a total Z or Z represents total property of a mixture, Zi bar or Zi bar is a partial molar property of component I in the mixture. Partial molar component uh, property of component I in the mixture is given by Zi bar. Okay, you have N1 moles of component 1, N2 moles of component 2, Nc moles of component C in the mixture. Okay, so and as you know, uh, <coughs> this Z, you can identify Z with G also. Say for example, Euler equation for G or Gibbs free energy is H minus Ts plus mu1 N1. See, this I have all defined, I have defined and derived right so it becomes this right which is h minus ts is nothing plus u plus bv minus ts mu1 n1 mu2 n2 up to mu j nj right you have say n j j components now as you know if i do dg dg is du plus pdv minus tds plus vdp right pdv plus vdp and this is minus sdt then mu1 dn1 mu2 dn2 n1 d mu1 n2 d mu2 right now if you think of that you have du since du is tds minus pdv according to first law so du pdv and tds cancel so you have vtp minus sdt and all these terms right now what i am telling is this is vgp minus sdt plus all these terms right so this is your equation one but we also know g is a function of temperature pressure and mole number and we can write an exact differential which is del g del pt and i which is basically v del g del t is minus s dt pni constant and there is this summation right we are writing this this entire thing as summation del g del ni dni right del g del ni dni remember del g del ni dni huh this is a alternate way this is the exact differential right that it is the exact differential and it's a function of temperature pressure and mole number of different components i right i varies from 1 to c say so it's an exact differential way and this is coming from the Euler equation. If you now compare 1 and 2, you get what is called a gibbs duhem relation. Remember for all partial molar property, whether it is partial molar volume, whether it is partial molar enthalpy, partial molar entropy, partial molar gibbs free energy or partial molar gibbs free energy is basically nothing but chemical potential, right? So uh, you have already seen this that gibbs duhem relation basically gives you Na, N1 d mu1 plus N2 d mu2 plus Ni d mu i equal to 0. And mu i is del g del Ni 
TP in J not equal to I, right? J not equal to I because we are changing mole number of I. We are not changing mole number of any other component, which is the partial molar gives way energy or more commonly known as chemical potential of component I in the mixture or the solution. So in the next, in the in the in the in the, in the subsequent uh, lecture, the last lecture, I will. Uh, Continue with this and I will show how differently say for example mu i can be written as del u del n i as you remember that all of these are related by Legendre transform and you basically replace one by the other. So if for example del u del n i you are taking s, v and n, j constant. In del h del n i you are taking s and instead of v you are taking the conjugate right which is p right s, p and n, j constant. Del f del n i which is basically the Helmholtz free energy you are taking v instead of yeah, instead of instead of S, you are replacing it with T and P, you are replacing with V, right? So physically, if you think of this S and V and N, so here you have taken V's there, but T, right? Instead of S, you are taking T, right? So basically, S and as you remember, T comma S are conjugate have conjugate relation, P comma V have conjugate relation, mu comma N have conjugate relation. Right. So basically, if I am looking at mu, so I don't care about this conjugate relation. But see, ultimately, if I instead of S and V, I replace it by P and T. Right. S and V, I replace by P and T. I basically get the chemical potential in terms of Gibbs free energy. So this is a change in Gibbs free energy, total Gibbs free energy. Remember, G here is an extensive quantity. It's not GM. G is an extensive quantity. The change in total Gibbs free energy as a function of uh, due to change in mole number of component I keeping all other components mole number constant and pressure and temperature constant. Okay. So this is how we will continue in the next lecture. We will continue and see that what are the consequences of this and how to model this um, and how to create these different models of solution, right? Quasi chemical models. I will come to that. Okay, so in the uh, following lectures, in some of the following lectures. Again, if you have any problem in understanding the concepts, you please drop a line in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, the forum. And also, um, I am going to, I am trying to arrange all, uh, to give you all the solutions up to week eight, up to once, once week eight is completed, I will give you all the solutions, are consolidated solutions from week zero to week uh, eight assignments. So, um, uh, so in fact, I am planning to conduct a live session after week eight. I will let you know uh, once everything is finalized. Thank you.